I, I do want to move on to uh, maybe some illustrations from the Venn diagram and kind of interrogate it. N.T. Wright has a, a wonderful little book, um, Jesus and the Powers, uh, him and uh, Michael Byrd wrote. And in, in that book, I think we uh, we mentioned before empire and, and absence. I'm going to reframe and, and narrow in and drill down a little bit more on some buzzwords, <laughs> perhaps, um, that I'm sure our audience is familiar with and, and, is, and is discussed there. But um, one of these kind of um, they, they warn against a couple of different ways of engagement with power. And one of them is if we were to push our Venn diagram together and push uh, to where there's very much overlap between the kingdom of earth and the kingdom of heaven, or even identifying circles, we might get a posture that today, um, maybe that option looks like something we would call Christian nationalism. So let me read uh, and get your response on this particular danger. Uh, we do want to move our our podcast towards some constructive things too, but let's let's sit with the let's problematize a little bit further. Um, let me read this here from from their book: Christian nationalism of the kind we have described is bad on every level imaginable. Christian nationalism does not lend itself to a tolerant society since it diminishes the rights of the people of other religions or no religion. It leads to a superficial Christianity rather than a uh, than to sincere faith and, and deep discipleship. Political leaders end up pretending to be religious merely to win the favor of their constituents. Christianity is used to justify unchristian policies and actions related to wars, immigration, income inequality, health care, and a myriad uh, other issues. Remember that even the devil can quote scripture and try to rub it in the face of Jesus. So maybe uh, any thoughts you have, this is the this is a great time to critique Christian nationalism. I'm sure you've you've thought of this before. Um, let's let's go for it. Let's problematize this uh, polite polite politely <laughs> or not politely. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. I love that what you can't see right now because this is audio is that Amanda is backing away from the camera and pointing at us to start this conversation. <laughs> True. Guilty as charged. <laughs> um, I do think it's worth noting, like I love what N.T. Wright says. I think it's worth noting that he is British as well, which I just, in reading yes. that book, I appreciated having a perspective on all of this that doesn't come from within the U.S. context. Sure. Um, certainly there's, you know, reference to that, but um there's the old saying of like an elder fish swam past two younger fish and said, Hey, how's the water today? And after he swam off, they looked at each other and were like, what's water. And I think that there's this just recognition that we need to have that sometimes we don't recognize like that we're swimming in the water that we're in and we're mm -hmm. so surrounded and immersed by it. But it can be really hard to pull yourself out and recognize what's there. But I think that Sometimes what I hear in Christian nationalism is that there is a belief um, and a hope that it is through government influence and power that Christian, I don't even want to say faith, um, maybe it's certain Christian values mm. um, are protected and rights maybe for a Christian, Christians. Maybe a Christian veneer maybe over, yeah. over society. Sure. yeah that that's protected. And I think what I get back to is if we look at generally any period of history, you see that it is actually when the people of God are not in a place of cultural hegemony that mm -hmm. actually believers thrive and the church grows and yeah. flourishes. And yeah. um, so there's part of me that... <laughs> As a human, I'm like, man, it's really nice when all of our rights as people, but believers specifically are protected and we have these freedoms and there are advocates, you know, within the government for what I believe. Mm -hmm. And there's also a part of me inside that's like, but if I really want, if I really at my core want to see people around the globe find the same hope and peace and joy in Christ that I have found, that might not actually be the way that it happens. Yeah. And how it happens is whatever happens at the ballot box, ultimately it comes down to me needing to take responsibility for what am I doing? How am I following Jesus yeah. today in a way that is bringing about human flourishing, that is showing the love of Christ to other people 
And I think that Christian nationalists abdicate their personal responsibility to the government. Oh, wow. Hot wow. take. Oh, hot take. Okay. But politely, re prophetically rebuking. I love it. Um, well, Amanda, I know you have some words. <laughs> well, come on. I, what you got? I, what you got? I don't know that I can say it any better than Sue Alice did, but I, I think I'll just say that like Christian nationalism, I believe, emerged from a truth that was then twisted into a lie the the truth and again this is this is what i believe maybe this is the hot take the hot take is that i believe that the ways of god walking in the way of jesus leads to the flourishing of society mm -hmm. the lie it, it, so so maybe that begins as a hope but the lie is that unless the government enforces that way enforces those values then i cannot flourish in my relationship with Christ. I cannot flourish as a believer, as oh, wow. a human. Wow. And, and the reality is that we actually see the church thriving in places That's where right. the government is overtly against them, overtly yeah. against them. And, and so I, yeah, I, I think that would be all that I have to say about that. Other than just the fact that, that but you know, there's, the reason we don't see very clear instructions on how to vote in scripture yeah. is because democracy was not a thing back then. I mean, democracy, the idea that each, like that, that, that governments are, um, you know, that, that, that political officials uh, serve the people, <laughs> that people vote, that each individual's rights matter. My goodness, this is very new in the history of humanity. Scripture doesn't, I think, Scripture doesn't address it overtly again because the 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 people of God lived in an in inherently oppressive, um, you know, political construct at that time. Um, you know, the the, the Roman government um, was an oppressor, was a colonizer, and a, a pagan. Um, it, there was a pagan tyrannical leader at the helm, and it was you know, it, and and still. I think it was Peter who said, you've been given everything you need for life and godliness. Mm -hmm. You've been given everything mm -hmm. you need. Um, it doesn't address how to vote because those people did, did not have the opportunity to vote, nor would Christians for uh, another, what, 1700 years. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it, 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 um, yeah maybe, maybe I'll end no, that's, there, but... that's helpful. And I, I think um, that's a good segue to critique the another perspective, because I, I think what... Um, you know, if we were to take that 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 reality that no, the the early Christians did not have a, a much of a say in the political happenings in ancient Rome, and 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 my goodness, yeah, you're talking about um, Sue Alice, the a history of persecution being, uh, you know, the first two two three hundred years of church history. I mean, it blew up. You know, it, it blew up uh, um, under persecution, um, and and it was compelling about that that it stretched across generations and cultures, and and. Uh, yeah, and all all under the thumb of Rome, and and um, yeah, what is it? Uh, is it Tertullian again? I, I keep on crediting him with everything. Uh, I think it's the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, or something like that. Is this this? Uh, yeah. So uh, now, do we? So then, let's uh, let's problematize this. What if we sought persecution? What if we advocated a role in society and actually kind of prayed for the demise of? Christian political influence. Okay, so let me. <laughs> I'm I'm stirring a pot. Hold on a minute. So let's go to other direction with the Venn diagram, um, and and maybe find uh, some common ground with the uh, the first approach uh, by critiquing a second approach, um, which would be to pull apart kingdom and and uh, of earth and kingdom of heaven to where they're they uh, we just abdicate. We we don't play the political game at all. And we don't show up for our uh, advocacy for morality or human flourishing or wh whichever concern brings us to the the, the, the place, and uh, and we leave that to those not of faith uh, or of different faiths. Um, let me um, read from again uh, N.T. Wright and Michael Bird's book. Uh, this is another thing that they would recommend we be against, and I'd love your response on this. They would say against civic totalism. That was a new word for me, so I am going to um, quit. There are four principles of this before I read their description. So they're principles of civic totalism. Uh, here we go. Emphases on a hierarchy of identities rather than the rule of law and equality before the law to negotiate relationships between citizens. 
two, and all this will make sense in a minute. I know it's it's a lot of buzzwords. Adoption of a mode of moral reasoning that assigns all people into the binary slots of either oppressor or oppressed. Three, legal preference for bespoke nations of equality rather than accommodating religious and cultural differences. And four, the state conceived no longer as an instrumental good, but as an ultimate power with jurisdiction over every facet of life in order to achieve a comprehensive renovation of society according to the state's progressive vision. So let me read their description of what it would be like under that. There is a danger in an aggressive uh, collectivism, which argues that persons should not be treated as individuals who are equal before the law so much as expressions of specific sexual and ethnic identities. The result is a state that invests religious energy into its own icons and living saints that punishes dissent from its own uh, narratives and finds oppression everywhere except in itself and in its systems that rewrites history as the history of a group identities in perpetual and unending conflict and that champions ethnic and sexual diversity while eliminating ideological diversity so uh that civic totalism we abdicate our role and the state runs its course and maybe the contours of this sounds familiar but um why why would we be uh why why should we not abdicate our role in the public sphere and let this happen um thoughts there <laughs> yeah i mean it's a it's it's a it's really complex it's a really complex sure. question but i think i mean i don't think and, and you know this is where we eventually want to get to i don't think we should abdicate our influence on any level, I don't, I don't, in the sense that, like, maybe whether it's the arts, whether it's um, the political sphere, whether it's service within the community, I just want to, I think we show up as believers, again, show up to bear witness. Um, and I, I yeah, I, but I, but again, I don't think that that means that we, we, we kind of hyper focus on political power as the way sure. to, um, to exact influence or to, 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 to get what we want out of society. Um, but I think, I think, uh, people of faith do bring a great wisdom. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which mm -hmm. I think um, a lot of just kind of the generally like um, acceptive truths in our society are actually inherited from a Christian worldview, primarily the dignity of humankind, this idea that all people bear the image of God. They might not use that language, but we all believe that human life matters, that every single human life matters. Uh, yep. That was not a given. That is yep. a truth that was bestowed upon society um, in many ways by Christianity. Mm -hmm. And it was embraced by the Enlightenment. And it was the thinkers of the Enlightenment that came up with democracy and all, all of that. And it's, it, I think it's something that in a lot of ways, a secular society just kind of takes for granted. That's right. um, and so that's the kind of wisdom that I believe we as believers can bring. Like we, we know what we we know what human dignity is. We know why there's human dignity. We not we know we know that oppression matters to God. We know that mm -hmm. um, that he he is constantly seeking those who are in the margins and and who are vulnerable. But I think we're actually able to define that maybe a bit mm -hmm. um, more comprehensively than um, than than uh, than others than others can. And so I, I yeah I think that's why I think it's important for Christians to engage because I, I think that there is a there's an inherent wisdom maybe that that we bring and that that's not to say people of faith don't also bring that wisdom and don't don't um don't bring an important perspective but that that's why I think it's necessary in many ways for us to engage okay yeah yeah I, I've, I've got ideas on that I'll let you respond to Sue Alice and yeah any any thoughts there yeah no I just want to add in like as as you're talking about that I kept coming back to John 17 when Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and yeah. says just as I didn't join the world's ways, I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, mm -hmm. but that you guard them from the evil one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's something that like we can't be separate from that and we can't be 
all of that either, it, either sides of this Venn diagram. And I think Jesus lays that out really clearly and actually does show us a really clear model of that, even though he was not in a democracy like ours. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. That is a bit different. And I think we have more opportunity to speak into what our government looks like now, but we can't we can't fully separate from that either. I think that's also abdicating responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think you're right about the abdicating responsibility piece. Like if we are supposed to show up for the flourishing of others, you know, um, and we, it's interesting because it seems like N.T. Wright and and Michael Bird, um, yeah, are kind of illustrating that the church can be a vanguard of healthy liberal democracies. And um, the, the role that we play in vanguarding that for the sake of others, but also for the flourishing of the freedom of the gospel to be a compelling, non, um, non-anxious non and non-domineering presence, but a persuasive presence among among the the the, the culture. I, I, I'm i I'm intrigued by that idea. Uh, Amanda, yeah, and, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one of the things, Ethan, you, you, you mentioned this kind of model of oppressor versus oppressed and I, i'm definitely not academically prepared to res respond robustly uh in, in that way but but one, one I thing mean, the i want to say and, on that note and such, yeah, yeah right no yeah, we're not the uh, annals of history <laughs> it's too yeah. early in the morning to yes. dive into that and it's frankly not even that early but um i, I what i want to say about that is what I, what i love about the story of Jesus story, the Bible is that it's, it's, it's so it's beautifully communal, but also beautifully individual in the sense that it, it, it names that no one person can be reduced to the identity group that they're a part of, that we all have hearts that are inclined towards the good and inclined towards evil. And there's a sense in which God deals with us individually. Um, but, but he also sees how the community that we're part of, um, impacts us. He he addresses communal oppression. He addresses communal marginalization in a way that really yeah. really matters. And so yeah. I I think that balance that that scripture uh, brings is uh, would be gosh such a breath of fresh air in this yeah, that's conversation. Right. That's right. But that's all I'm gonna. That's all I'm able to say. About but that. I, but I'll piggyback off what you said earlier and connect that idea from something that they. Uh, the, again, quoting from uh, N.T. Wright and Michael Bird, um, it, it's a bit of a paragraph, but I think it's worth the read. Just, just bear with me for a second. Uh, this is this is going on to those ideas that Christianity introduced into the world, and so, yeah, let me let me read it. Um, I'm interrupting myself. Most people in today's world recognize as noble the ideas that we should love our enemies, that the strong should protect the weak. And that it is better to suffer evil than to do evil. People in the West treat such things as self-evident moral facts. Yet such values were certainly not self-evident to the Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Vikings, Ottomans, Mongols, or Aztecs. The reason why most people today accept those ideals as axiomatic is that we are products of the Christian revolution. Even when people hotly deny this, insisting with some justification that it's the churches, that it's the church that had been the oppressor, the moral uh, protest against oppression itself is rooted in Christian belief. For the Christian meshes is that all human beings reflect the image of God. God loved the world so much that he sent his son to have it. And the cross proves that the true power is found in weakness Greatness is attained in service. Revenge only begets greater evil, and all victims will be vindicated at God's judgment seat. That is what has been wired into the moral compass of the Western of Western civilization. Whether we are conservatives who believe that uh, the voiceless and vulnerable ba vulnerable babies should not have their lives ripped apart in utero, or progressives who contend that women have the right to control ha have control over their own bodies, we are all arguing in Christian language, and we are trading in Christian currency. And I guess. Uh, to, to end their quote there and comment on it. I think that's that's what I want uh, to remind myself as I'm looking at this other option of like absence um, when uh, this this other this civic totalism um, that that the state determines all of these things. Look, the and, and this is a great common ground bridge builder. Here, 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 here's what I would say in the purple conversation. I don't know. Maybe some people are listening to this like, man, you're not you're not red or blue. Like I'm, I'm disappointed. You're purple. Uh, the, the reality is that there are, are moral fine points that the partisans have settled on that are actually morally grounded in Christian concern. As you mentioned, the dignity of human life, the ideals of human flourishing. And if we can seek 
regardless of what side of the aisle you defer to or default to, if you can seek to honor the concern of the dignity of, of a human, whether it be an issue of immigration, abortion, whether it be an issue uh, of economics or uh, you know warfare and international relationships, um, most of the time, in in my in my experience, listening to political commentators, they're they're expressing the concern of of humanity that indeed as 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 a bird and, and right put it, they're trading in Christian currency. And I think if we acknowledge that, we might find more common ground. We might find um, whether or not people give Christianity the credit for those ideas is not our concern, because uh, I, I believe, uh, I'll put it this way, regardless of whether or not we sit in a Christian nationalist country or we sit in a, in a, in a civic totalist country, uh, whichever version of America uh, we uh, you know inherit and and build and our kids inherit and build, um, I believe the compelling nature of the cross and the kingdom will succeed in any environment. And I and I, I just I, I so how, how to put it this way? I while I don't want to advocate our responsibility, I do believe in the sovereignty of God to the point where whatever role we can wisely play in our communities at the time that we're given to advocate for shalom in, in a myriad ways, um, may we not buy into the narrative of uh, the, the false eschatology of Christian nas nationalism or the false narrative of, of civic totalism. There's a more comprehensive way, as you're talking about, Amanda, that, that uh, the Bible correlates all of these concerns and these aches of the human heart are met in the gospel, and I, I believe that that has staying power that will outlast the empires and 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 and, and the messes of human power that that we see in, in today's world. So you know, I, I think can we show up non anxiously, play our role, advocate for human flourishing, um, uh, find the common ground, and yeah, I see that you're you're you. I thank you. You're like Jesus in this area because you're advocating uh, for for human dignity. I disagree with you on this thing, and here's why: because of human dignity, because of the gospel, and and trade across the aisle and build that bridge. Um, I, I wonder what that non-anxious, conciliatory, um, uh, prophetic, uh, shalom-building presence would look like in, uh, yeah, among the blue, among the red, um, among the purple. Um, what would that look like, and and how could uh, we do that?